pronounced shame. And in the, from the Hebrew, the Greek, the name is, the word name is onoma. And that deals with conduct, character, authority, and purpose. But in the Old Testament it deals with the authority, the character, and the purpose. So herein, uh, the Lord is really holding his name in reverence. And he feels that we should, as his people, also hold his name in reverence. As I shared with you before, the, the word name is not just dealing with the title of Jesus or the title of God, but it's also dealing with the conduct, character, authority, and purpose of God. And we are to be witnesses of God for all of the world who does not know God. They can't know God because of their ways. And so God enters within us. In the Old Testament, he was upon us, but he wants us to be representatives of his ways and to give evidence of the fact that he's with us. And that if God be with us, he's more than a world against us. He wants to show himself to be God through our lives because they cannot know God because they're in sin. And John 9, 31 says, God heareth not sinners. So we are representatives of God everywhere we go, uh, on our jobs, on our block, in our neighborhoods, our communities. We are to be representative of God in our churches. Everywhere we are to show his ways. And he says in Isaiah 55 and 8 that my ways they are not your ways and my thoughts they are not your thoughts but as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my thoughts and my ways higher than yours and it's difficult for us in our own lifestyles to show the ways of God and so God wants us to be equipped to show his ways so herein verse 22 he said therefore say I unto the house of Israel thus said the Lord God I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine own, for mine holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen where you went. And I will sanctify, which means to set apart for my own use. I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord because they can't know he's the Lord. And that's why we are chosen and set apart from the rest, sanctified for the Lord's use so we can show his way because they don't know the right way. And the conducts of the flesh does not propagate the right way. It is showing the ways of Satan. Selfishness, wanting to be their own God and doing things according to the seeking of one's own prosperity. But God is love and his objective is to care for and to aid and to help others. So he says, I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Verse number 24, he says, I will take you from among the heathen, that means from the world system, and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you clean water upon you, that's a washing and cleansing, from all of your filthiness and from all your idols, and I will cleanse you. Talk about baptism and the workings of repentance. He says, a new heart also will I give you because of the conducts of the flesh itself, the hearts are evil and selfish. So God says, I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit will I put within you. So God's going to cause your spirit to be changed inwardly. He said that I will take away the stony heart out of you. That means the coldness, the hardness. And I will give you a heart of flesh, which means a tender heart. And I will put my spirit within you. Where? Say it loud. Going to put his spirit, the Holy Ghost, within you and we're going to look at where the Holy Spirit is within you he said and cause you to walk in my statutes and he shall and you shall keep my judgments and do them and do them so the Lord said he will cause you to walk in his statutes cause you and you shall dwell in the land that I 
gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. And I will say, and I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will cause, and I will call for the corn, and I will increase it, and lay no famine among you. And so the Lord is dealing with the multiplication, the blessings being upon us. Say favor. He's dealing with granting us favor. And he's saying, all this I'm going to cause to happen to you. Because I'm going to put a new heart in you. I'm going to put my spirit within you. All right, let's go take a look at the book of... Now, I want to first share with you that the word cause, dealing with the fact that the devil causes us to do dumb stuff. Am I right? He causes us. But the Lord now is telling us that he's going to cause something to happen for us. He's going to work on our behalf. Take a look at the book of Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5. And let's start at verse number 19. At verse, in, in verse number 19, the Lord talks about the works of the conducts of the flesh. So this is what happens to us because of the fact that we are under the Adamic influence and Satan can work through because he took over and took control by manipulation of the life of Adam. And so the nature of the flesh is to do not God's will, but to do self-will. He told uh, Adam and Eve, you shall be as God. So God does whatever God wants to do, and God doesn't obey the laws of God. So herein, the book of Galatians chapter 5, Paul says this in verse 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts or the desires of the flesh. So walk means conduct yourself. So he says, conduct yourself in the spirit. What spirit? Notice that it says here in verse 16, a capital S, which means God's spirit. So he says, conduct yourself in God's spirit. All right, verse 17 says, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, the God spirit, which is the Holy Ghost. And the spirit, the Holy Ghost, against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of God's Spirit or the Holy Ghost, you are not under the law, which means the workings of the way the flesh works. Excuse me. He says in verse 19, now the flesh, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God actually deals with the entrance into the, entrance into the Holy Ghost. So they cannot receive of the new indwelling of the Spirit of God. So the conduct of the flesh does not get revelation, information, or anointing, or power because it comes from the Holy Ghost. And they are not called amongst the kingdom of God. They are not considered the born again because of the conducts of the flesh. Now, see, ob the objective of God is to show his ways operative through his people. So we are to give evidence, and your ways give evidence. So God shows his ways. In Galatians 5 and 22, he said, Now the fruit or the conduct of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is joy, love, peace, Long-suffering, which means patience, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith. Meekness, which means temperance or, or self-control. Meekness, then temperance, which means self-control. Meekness means um, the ability to be able to, to be taught, teachableness. A meek person, you can teach them. Prideful person, you can't. So meekness and temperance means self-control. He said, against such, there is no law. 
and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. So if we live in the spirit, if we live where? In the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Now, bear in mind in Leviticus chapter 17, verse number 11. Let's go there. The book of Leviticus chapter 17, verse number 11. We got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 17, verse number 11, the word of the Lord says, are you there? Amen. So the word of the Lord says, for the life of the flesh is, where? In the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. In the blood. And I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is a blood that makes an atonement for the souls. Well, what's the significance of the blood? Well, let's first of all help you to understand that in your body is blood. And it's like a river. And it's flowing through to every area of your body. But inside of your bloodstream is you. You are a spirit and your life, the life of you is within your bloodstream. Uh, you are a spirit and the Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, R-U-A-H or R-U-A-C-H. Ruach actually means the breath of life. The breath of life. And the Bible said that God formed man of the dust of the ground, Genesis 2 and 7, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Man is a spirit and he has a living soul. But that living soul was given life when God breathed the ruach, the breath into it. Amen? So... We, we have to understand very clearly that if you put a tourniquet around your wrist, you have mobility with your fingers. You can pick things up. But if you put a tourniquet around your wrist, in just a few minutes, you could move those fingers. And the reason why is because your circulation is cut off. And your circulation is the blood flow is being blocked off and what's in the blood flow what's in the blood flow is your spirit the life of your flesh and uh, there is a telepathic communication going on from your thought life and information that you tell your hand through thought to do cannot be conveyed so when you think you say, I want to pick that up. Automatically, you think and the thought is being conveyed through your bloodstream just that fast. Just like if you, uh, someone uh, dropped an electric cable inside a pool, you could be in the pool on the other end of the pool, but as soon as that electric cable drops into the pool, the telepathy moves so quickly it's almost instant and uh, you're going to get electrocuted. Well the same principle applies information travels just that fast from your thought to your hand. And so when you say I'm gonna, I want to pick that up that thought is immediately conveyed and uh, your hand grabs it and does just what was in your thought pattern. It picks it up and it's so quick you put, probably couldn't time it. So you're conveying information from your thought life to every area of your body through your bloodline. And inside of your bloodline is your spirit. The ruach, the breath of life. Or in the Greek language would be the pneuma, where we get our word pneumonia. A pneuma is P-N-E-U-M-A. 
So, your thoughts are coming from your soul. Your mind gives you pictures of what you desire. Your emotions like or dislike the pictures that are seen in your mind. And your will causes you to choose to receive or reject the information. So if you choose to pick that up, now your, the information is being conveyed through your body system, through that river of blood, and the telepathy is going right through your spirit, and you pick it up. If you put a tourniquet around your wrist, you couldn't pick it up because there's no blood flow to give that information to your hand. Kinetically, there's no information, and the hand is in a state of death because it's separated from the life. So life or death is a separation from life. So herein, what God wants to do is put his spirit within you. And where is his spirit operative in you? It's in your bloodline, in union with your spirit. And the influence of God's spirit within your spirit, the Holy Spirit within your spirit, is causing the information of God to influence your ways. So that's why it's important to have the Holy Ghost. Because your ways indicate that you are God's child. You understand? However, when you receive of the Holy Ghost, your ways are being influenced by God and the things that you normally may desire to do, you don't want to do them anymore. And that's why I said walk in the spirit so you don't fulfill the, the lust of the flesh. Because when you're in the flesh, you're compelled by the flesh, which is being influenced by the Adamic nature and also by demon spirits that are operating in the atmosphere not to do the will of God, but in fact to do the will of the devil to rebel against God. That's why it's important for us to pray, especially in the Holy Ghost, because then we create a climate of the arising of the Holy Ghost within us, and it's like God's power turning up the fire on the inside. You got a fire on the stove, and it's down low, but now you, you, you've got that little pilot light, but then you turn it up, and the fire begins to completely consume. The Lord says in Zechariah 2 and 5, I will be a wall of fire about you, around you, and the glory there in the midst. So God's presence sort of swells up in you. And his presence completely circumferences you. So that when the outside forces in the atmosphere come to try and influence, they can't penetrate that shield that is there within you, within you. There's a shield around you, like the Bible calls it a consuming fire. It's like Daniel, remember? When he was, or rather Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were placed in the fiery furnace, the shield of God was completely upon them. And even though they were in the fire, the literal fire couldn't touch them because the literal fire is a destroying fire. But the spiritual fire of God is a consuming fire. It engulfs you and it restores you. But the natural fire destroys. It burns things up. The fire of God is a restorer. It restores and it completely rebuilds you. So as it relates to God, he wants to be within us. That's why it's important to have the Holy Ghost. The word says, seek ye first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness or his ways. Then all these things that you desire will be added to you, but from the right way. Amen? Amen. And so God wants you to be full of uh, the Holy Ghost. So the Bible says in Romans 14 and 17, 
that the kingdom of God is not in meat and in drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy, where? In the Holy Ghost. In the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is in you, and you are in the Holy Ghost. So greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So now that takes on more understanding to you. He's in you. Where? In the blood. He's entered within. It's a blood thing. You understand? And so there's power where? Ah, now you get the picture. The power is where? In the blood. So you've been hearing people say that for years. Now it takes on a more in-depth connotation. Now you see the picture. The power is in the blood. What blood? Your blood. You understand? But now your blood by faith has commingled and you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And when it talks about the blood of Jesus Christ, it's referring to the life of God. You understand? Because the life of the flesh is where? In the blood. Leviticus 17, 11 says that. So it doesn't just apply to us. It also applies to God. So Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. And what was in his blood? The life. The life. Go to 1 John. Go to 1 John chapter 1. Here is John talking about what we're talking about now. But I'm giving you a more in-depth breakdown of it. So in 1 John chapter 1, are you there? John begins to talk about this. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have held, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of what? The word of life. So as it relates to Jesus in John 6, 63, he says, my words, they are spirit and they are life. My words, they are spirit and they are life. So his words is the presence of the Holy Ghost, life, and his words, he said, are spirit. So where is your spirit? In the blood, Leviticus 17 11. So where was the spirit of God? In Jesus. In the blood. That's the principle. It's in the blood. So remember that in the bloodstream is the flow of life. And it's flowing and it of course, rises up in the word. So when you think a thought and you decide to do something, as I showed you the illustration of picking up the handkerchief, that is a word being manifested within me. And so if it's God's spirit, then that conduct that's coming forth from thought is flowing in him to, just if Jesus wanted to pick up a handkerchief. He does it by his spirit. Zechariah 4 and 6, he says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. So where is the spirit or his spirit? It's in his blood. So when his spirit is in you, where is his spirit? It's in your blood. You understand? And so the significance of the life is in the blood. The blood is a transmitter. It is a river by which it flows. You understand? So the Bible says in John 7, 39, out of your belly shall flow what? Rivers of what? Not water, living water. Living water. What is the living water? That's the Holy Ghost. 
That's the Holy Ghost. Keep your finger on 1 John 1. And let's go over to John 7, 39 real quick. Let me show it to you. In John 7, 39, Jesus is speaking, and he says, if any man, in verse, verse 37, he says, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of what? Living water. This is another description of the Holy Ghost. You understand? The Holy Ghost is the living water. Look at verse 39. This spoke he of the Spirit, which they that believe of him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So the Holy Ghost, the Bible tells you in verse 39, is God's Spirit. Plainly, he's called the Holy Ghost. And he is the living water, as the Bible clarifies this spoke he of the Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. The living water is the Holy Ghost. You understand? And so now, he's flowing within you like a river, and he's flowing in Jesus like a river, and all thoughts are conveyed, and they are transmitted through your life system, which is your blood. So inside of your bloodstreams uh, are tiny, uh, what we could say, oxygen units flowing through. And through that oxygen units, those oxygen units, there's information being sent. Just like when you from in the realm of the first heaven or in the natural life, we have wind, oxygen. And we send radio waves through that wind or oxygen. And through that wind or oxygen, there are little tiny molecules we can't see called atoms, neutrons, protons. They make up what we call the atmosphere. And that's how the information is conveyed through a word to one and to other. And so the information is coming from one's thought. Oftentimes in music, sometimes in television, but the information is conveyed and you gain it through your five senses and then that's the five outer gates and then the one inner gate is your thought life or your imagination. So now you're getting those images, but you got six points of entry by which information comes in to you. You got it? So now, as it relates to the Holy Ghost, we know that the devil has influenced the flesh. And the flesh is what we're living in, like a hand inside of a glove. The glove is not the life, but the life is in the glove. So when you pull the hand out, the glove has what? No life. So when you pull the spirit out of the body, it's breathed its last breath, it's expired, which means the breath has left. And the body has, like the glove, no life. So as long as the spirit is within the body or the hand in the glove, then the glove has life or the spirit or the body has life. Are you with me? So when the body has life, what's in the life is the spirit, or rather what's in the body is the spirit, and it's circulating life. And as long as it's there, you can use that body by sending telepathic communication to different parts like the legs, the feet, the toes, and they can, you can have a thought and say, I'm just gonna wiggle my toe. And just that quick, your toe moves. Why? Because your thought has relayed and conveyed the information through that bloodline river. And that thought is now 
caused or commanded that toe to move. Well, the same principle applies when, when you are being influenced by demon spirits that have gained entry to your flesh because you've done a sin, which means you've opened up one of those gates for those spirits to come in. And then also by the natural influence of the Adamic nature, which open up for wrong thoughts and spirits to enter naturally and become one with that embodiment. And they passed on through each child that's produced in this realm, the sin nature. But we then are called the children of disobedience because in this, this, the, the natural, that's Ephesians 2 and 2, the children of disobedience, because we don't know the will of God and we don't desire to do the will of God because that's all we know to do is the world, world's ways or the system of this world's ways. So the Bible says in God of this world, in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, the God of this world blinds the mind. He's influencing us, inspiring us, and informing us ways that are not God's ways. That's why God said in Isaiah 55 and 8, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts and my ways higher than yours. In other words, we have lowered ourselves. Our ways are a lowered standard. They're not of God. And so God wants us to come on up a little higher. He wants us to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Because now, the Bible says in Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And so the Son desired to do the will of the Father. So our desires are changed, which our desires emit from the heart. And our hearts are changed. We now have a tender heart, like God's heart. And, but we have to be matured into God's ways by practice. And if we are around the world system constantly, then we'll, by influence, inspiration, information, pick up and continue to desire to do their ways. So that's why the Lord sanctifies us, which means he sets us apart for his use. And he wants us around someone who he has anointed, primarily a pastor, hopefully that pastor is living for God. And uh, Jeremiah 3.15 says, I will give you pastors after mine own heart who will feed you with knowledge and with understanding. And the Bible plainly says in Proverbs, with all thy getting, get what? understanding and so what we have to do is understand that God wants to be in us so that we can be around or away from all that old stuff we used to do and continually feeding upon the word of God because the word of God is life and it will change our ways because now there will be thoughts in us to draw from whenever we have a need for a thought we can draw from the right ways to do things the right thoughts will come forth because the Holy Ghost will bring all truths whatever the Lord has given us and so now the life of God is flowing in us in our bloodstream and the Lord has paid the price for us with his blood and his blood being clean and holy, he himself who had never sinned uh, becomes the person who is the representative for us, stands in our place. Let me give you the example. The example of the football team is when they start the game, they got to flip the, talk, the coin toss. That determines who's going to do what. Are you going to receive or are you going to kick the ball? So when the team goes on the field, they don't need the whole team to go out. One person represents the team. That's called the captain. The captain goes out, and he meets the referee with the captain of the other team on the field, in the middle of the field, and they make a coin toss. And so whoever wins the coin toss gets to receive or to kick. Let's just say they want to receive. 
no matter what they want to do, this particular team wins the coin toss. So in winning the coin toss, that actually means that the whole team who he's representing has also won the coin toss. Are you with me? So Jesus was our captain. He takes responsibility for all of our lives and he goes on the field, so to speak, and he does battle for our souls. He wins the coin toss. So if he wins, what happens? We all win. So all of us now are in a sin-forgiven state because of what he did. He died. He gave his life. All of us should be dead, dead because the Bible says the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So he becomes our Savior, the captain of our team. And we are now, if we receive and we um, go along with him and accept him as our Savior, are now given a measure of faith and we are in the seed of God and we must be developed. So now the words that we're constantly reading are putting thoughts in our head of God. So now when those thoughts enter into us, we're being transformed. How? By the renewing of our mind, Romans chapter 12 says. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice. Give up these bodies because they're teaching you wrong. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, that you may what? Prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So now we're going to prove the will of God because now once the Holy Ghost comes into us, and we're constantly feeding upon the word of God, then our thoughts are being filled with the ways of God. Remember now, when you were a child, you knew not just about nothing. You knew nothing. And you gained information and inspiration through the influence of the world system. So now also the body does not desire to do the will of God. It wants its own way. But now it needs information to do a way. And information that was received was through the influence, the inspiration, and the information of the world system. But now once we start re reading the Bible consistently, we're getting information about God, God's ways, God's people, just like you were influenced by the world's people in their ways. Now, when we get ready to do something, we draw a thought. It's in the... Uh, the, the library of our mind. You can't do what you don't know to do. You can only do what you know. And so if all you knew was the world system, then that's what you do, their ways. But now you've got new information in you. And you've got another library filled up with the ways of God by reading the word of God, by receiving the word of God, by hearing the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we got the word of God. And his words are spirit. So we're being filled on the inward so that when we think a thought now, the Holy Ghost brings all things to mind. He brings them from where? From our new library. And so once we learn the way the word of God is in us, the Holy Ghost draws this stuff up when the situation arrives. Instead of us now going immediately to the flesh, the thoughts and ways, we're now being directed by the Holy Ghost to the thoughts of God and the way of God. So Paul says in Philippians uh, 2 and 5, let this man be in you that was in Christ Jesus. So what man? That was a man of the Holy Ghost, a man of God, God the Holy Ghost. And he's now showing God's ways in the library. We're drawing up what, what would God do? It's coming up on our mind by the power that's in us, the Holy Ghost. And so now the telepathy that goes through our bodily system through that river of blood is being directed by the Holy Ghost. Instead of doing what we would normally do, even though that thought may try to rise up, the Holy Ghost takes over and he directs our path and directs our step through our body to do what we normally didn't do. Now we're doing the ways of God. So the more we 
See, the Bible said we have not, why? Because we ask not. So the more we pray and worship, we're invoking the presence of God and we're causing the Holy Ghost to rise up in us. And this anointing in our bloodstream makes us feel like a balloon rising up in us and we're now compelled to do differently than what we normally would do. And so the blood of Jesus Christ had delivered us from Satan. We're not his. He can't take command over us. We're God's now. And so because we're God, he raises up a what? Standard against the enemy. You understand? The Lord will lift up a standard against him. So we're normally where he could just have immediate access to us. Now the Holy Ghost rises in us through the blood. And that shield is around us. And that shield is a hedge. It's a hedge. You understand? So what is a hedge? The hedge is a shield around you. Where the enemy cannot get to it. Where it rises up within us. And so it's a sort of invisible screen where when, when, when like the, the enemy runs, just imagine your window. You've seen the commercial where there's a guy and there's a window and all of a sudden, boop, he hits the window and drops everything. Well, the enemy is seeing us, but he's trying to come to us, and he can't because we got a shield up. You got it? So the Bible says the Lord is our shield and our what? Buckler. He's got us shielded in. You understand? So we have his presence within us, but it doesn't work unless we call on him. You understand? The Holy Ghost is where? In us. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And when we ask for his presence, help me, Lord, immediately the shield comes up. You understand? And you have not because you don't ask. If you, if you don't ask, then now you're tempted to do or be drawn by whatever influence the devil sends towards you. And within you is a natural propensity to do that which is wrong through the flesh. But when the Holy Ghost is in you, because you've been filled with the Holy Ghost and you've been filled with the Word of God, you got to have both. Because the Holy Ghost will lead you and direct you through instinct. But when you got the Word of God, He got more to draw from to tell you in thought. You got it? Because things are being told to you through thought. Thought connects to a word, and the word is sent through your body or to someone else. You understand? And I showed the illustration with Minister Dee Dee the other day as it relates to me asking her to bring me an ink pen. She brought the pen or the yellow marker. She brought the marker because she received my word. If I didn't give her the information, no matter what I was thinking, she would have done it. She did it because I conveyed, I sent my word that was in my thought through my breath, or my voice, my laloon, my speech. And it was sent to her, and she got it. It got inside of her, and she performed what I requested. That's called obedience. So the Holy Ghost now is in us, and we got words for him to draw up in us. If we don't have any word in us, then even though he's trying to compel us to do the right thing, we don't get it. We're, getting, we're drawing from the information that's from the world system. And that's why we got carnal Christians. People who have no word in them. They do what they used to do. And the Holy Ghost could be urging them and nudging them to do what's right. But they're being compelled by the flesh. Excuse me. It's a little hate, people. We're being compelled by the flesh. And then there's no information for the Holy Ghost to draw from, even though some people may be filled up with the Holy Ghost. They don't have any word. So the flesh is still having influence and then there's no shield being drawn up because they don't pray in the Holy Ghost. And because they don't pray and seek God's presence. God's a gentleman. He's not going to override your free will. So what he's doing is he's waiting for you to ask for him. Then if he has permission, he will do things for you by your request. That's why prayer is so essential. So when you pray in the Holy Ghost, it's even more effective because things that are in your heart are being conveyed to the Holy Ghost. And so now everything that is in you, he's knowing. 
And he then begins to move and urge you by direction. And he also brings things your way through other people because of his presence being everywhere. Remember, he's God, so he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. So all things and all people, he has an influence over. No matter who they are, he can draw them. The Bible said your blessing will what? Overtake you. So he can cause them to come your way and overtake you. You don't have to go looking for your blessing. Your blessing will come looking for you. That's why it's essential to get the word in you so the Holy Ghost can lead you in thought and he can compel you by his presence in you. So he's in you. Amen. Now go back to uh, 1 John. Chapter 1, Paul, or rather John, is amazed because the Lord wants him to be right up under him because he wants him to learn how the Holy Ghost works so he can convey it to us. So he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it. And bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested, manifested unto us. The life he's referring to is God's presence in the spirit, now operative within our spirit and working through us. He says that which we, verse 3 says, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. He says now in us so I can speak it. I can't speak what's in me. Now I can declare unto you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son and his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy be full. And how is it full? It's full by the Holy Ghost being in us. So the part of the Holy Ghost is joy. Joy. So he has different elements of him. This is why he have different, we have different parts of us. We've got arm, leg, feet. All those are parts of us. And all does a different thing. Same thing with the Holy Ghost. He have different parts of him. There are components of him. Just like you have different ways that are distinct from someone else. Well, he told you about his ways, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Now, once you receive him in you, those ways are also in you. And so he tells you about the spirit of holiness. So you can't be holy without the Holy Ghost. So when you get the Holy Ghost and you're moving by the word of God, you're now living holy. The Bible said uh, in Romans 1 and 4, and declared to be the son of God with power. How was he declared to be the son of God? What power? The Holy Ghost. Once you receive the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, and now are we the sons of God. You understand? By the Holy Ghost being in us, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Amen. And so the Bible says, if that spirit be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, he will quicken your mortal, your mortal body. He will quicken your mortal, your mortal body. So the Holy Ghost, the word quicken means to bring life to. So he will quicken your mortal body. When he's in you, he will cause life and liveness to flow through you the ways of God that have now been instructed to you by the power of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is necessary for all of us to have, not some of us, not going just going to church. Going to church is good, but what good is it if you don't have the Holy Ghost? Because the Holy Ghost is the kingdom of God. So now when you receive of the Holy Ghost, you're in the kingdom. If you're not 
filled with the Holy Ghost, you're not in the kingdom. So the Lord wants us to be quickened. Amen. Uh, go to 1 Peter 3.18. The book of 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 18. Amen. Are you there? First Peter, chapter 3, verse 18. Are you there? For Christ also has suffered for sins, the, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but what? Quickened by the Holy Ghost. Your Bible says the Spirit. By which, Peter says, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. What prison? Talking about hell in the antediluvian world. Not the prisons San Quentin and Folsom. <laughs> Talking about in hell. The ones that were held in bondage. Because remember in Matthew 27, 52, the Bible says that when he got up, those saints that were gone on, got up also with him and began to walk back into the city of Jerusalem. So he brought them to life. Death was, had to loose them. Take a look at, uh, let me see, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 13. All right, here we go. So in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says, are you there? And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Uncircumcision means it's not been cut away. Has he quickened together with Christ having forgiven you all trespasses. You've been forgiven how many trespasses? All. So you have no more trespasses. But the devil keeps whispering in your mind that they're trespassing against you so you feel uncomfortable and you feel guilty and you don't function normally. Faith gives you full confidence because if the Holy Ghost is in you, you're God's child. So do you walk around the house being mad at your child all day long? No, you forgive your child. And you love your child because now that's your child. You understand? And so God has given us forgiveness. And we are confident that when we leave the house, no matter where we go, we're still our parent's child. Amen. So I don't care where I go, I'm still God's child. I don't cease being God's child. I don't cease being able to call home, call my mother and father. You understand? We don't cease. So no matter what, where we are, we still have access to the Holy Ghost. And the devil tries to produce guilt and shame upon us in error, but we're still God's children. Your child, even though they've done something wrong, is still able to call you. Am I right about it? All right. So he's trying to get us to understand that we have access to God. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Let me see if I can close this up for you. Ephesians chapter 2. All right, right after Galatians. The book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 5. So in 1 he says, And you has he quickened who were dead in sins and trust, in, in dead in, in trespasses and sins. So he already has quickened you. It's over with. You saved. You're God's child. Verse 5 says, even when we were dead 
in sins. Even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ. For by grace you're saved. You're saved. So now the Holy Ghost is in you. It's important that you are filled with the word of God so you have the access and knowledge and influence of the Holy Ghost. The influence, the inspiration, the information. And the holiness is in you. But if you don't have any word in you, you have more propensity to sin. You compare more to sin. So the Holy Ghost is the presence of God living within us, and we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and he's now existent in our bloodstream, and he's flowing through us to lead us and guide us, but we got to put information so the Holy Ghost can lead us to all truths. Do you understand that? Very important that we understand that we also have the spirit of faith, through the Holy Ghost, we have the spirit of holiness. We have the spirit of adoption, according to Romans 8 and uh, 15. And uh, the spirit of uh, faith is in, found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. We have the spirit of promise. So all the promises can come to us through Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. The promise of the Holy Ghost to be filled within us, we can have. He becomes our comfort, according to John 14, 26. And Ephesians 1 and 7. He's the spirit of wisdom and revelation or the revealings of God. He, he gives us the right answers. So the Holy Ghost is very significant for all of us to have. And he gives us grace. He gives us glory. He gives us truth. We have the eternal spirit living in us. And we have Jesus through the Holy Ghost. By receiving him by faith. He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Amen. He is our seal. Ephesians 1.13 said, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. And he's the oil, the light, the revelation, the healing, and the anointing for service. So the Holy Ghost is the great presence of God within us. Where? In our, the blood. You understand? And so it's very important that we understand that our blood has been transitioned. Not of the bloodline of our old family members, but now we are full of the blood of Christ by the Holy Ghost. Do you understand? The life of the flesh is where? Come on, give God a hand to praise. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God. All right. Um, if you'd like a copy of this message, do call our church office at 562-653-9868. I'm Apostle Reginald Lawrence bidding you God bless you. Jesus loves you, and his word is... On the move. Do bear in mind that you can call out, check out our website at www.codii.org. That's codii.org. You may also help this ministry by giving online at our secured site on our web, and uh, you can see any of the previous services and the archives. You can also check out us on Ustream. There's also a radio broadcast every Friday at uh, 1 o'clock on KTYM 1460 on your AM dial. Uh, if you'd like a copy of this message, leave your information on the, the phone number at 562-653-9868, uh, and we'll respond to your request. This is the last teaching on the Holy Spirit. May God bless us all. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> all right. Did y'all get that? Huh? So now you better understand yourself in the relationship with the Holy Ghost. You should by now.